So the thing that you need to do as anybody who gets into the occult uh, practice or the, the study of ancient wisdom or symbolism is you have to make these symbols a part of your consciousness. Well, what I'm getting at is we now know that within the last oh, 100 to 150,000 years there have been at least a dozen global catastrophes. At least a dozen that we now know about. Yet we humans have endured through that whole process. How did we manage to survive when the woolly mammoths didn't, when Neanderthals didn't, when the saber-toothed cats didn't, when the giant ground sloths didn't, when 13 other hominid species didn't, how did we manage to survive? How is it that we are able to be sitting here tonight having this discussion? Well, if you read all of the myths, they're all consistent in one element. Somebody within the mass of humanity had foreknowledge. And they responded by, typically in the Judeo-Christian tradition, what did Noah do? He built an ark. Right? He built an ark. And then, of course, Zisithrus in the Sumerian tradition. What did he do when he had foreknowledge? Built an ark. What did Manu do? You know, in the Indus Valley tradition, what did Manu do when he, he built an ark? Now, we always picture arks as being big wooden boats. And... I think it's highly plausible that people did build big wooden boats to survive the kinds of floods that have now been geologically confirmed to have happened. But maybe they built other kinds of arcs. What did you say would be a, 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 a logical response to knowing that there was an impending global catastrophe? Move. 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 Go to another planet. Where would we, where, okay, let's stop and think about that for a minute. Maybe we didn't go to another planet, we just stepped off of this one for however long it took to repair itself and it came back. See, I'm going to probably go along with you on that. Uh, uh, the, well, okay, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and fling open the gates, okay? Where would be a very logical place to go in terms of what would be a possible natural ark for humans to take refuge on or in, in the event of a global catastrophe? The answer to that question could probably be given to us if we were to ask it to the man in the moon probably knows the answer to that question. <laughs> Which is Randall. <laughs> well, it's not me. But somebody knew. Somebody designed this as the... Mm -hmm. We now know that the five-pointed star represents what? The Masonic five-pointed star is... Sirius. Sirius, yes. What do we see here? This is the, this is the uh, bicentennial commemorative silver dollar. What's going on there? I'm the moon and the Liberty Bell. The moon and the Liberty Bell. Now they're juxtaposed. The Liberty Bell is juxtaposed on the moon. Well, what is it about the Liberty Bell? Did you want to know <laughs> Yeah, you might be right. It might be the old world order. Uh, 
I don't know. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah. yeah. Bring it up. <laughs> well, I don't have it all ready to give to you yet, but I'm just, this is a sneak preview. Yes. Who, I had Elizabeth read this a couple of weeks ago. The Egyptian inscription says, she rose with the dog star. Remember? Yeah. Who? Who was it? Isis. Isis. Here's Isis. Notice, what, what are we, what's being associated with Isis here? The moon, yes. Notice how she's standing in the ark. And notice how the ark is floating in the waters. Almost as if it was a boat. Almost as if it was a ship, right? Reminiscent of the uh, Egyptian ships. Sure. And what do you call Egyptian ships? What, what's the word? Oh, uh, ark. Well, what is it? Ark. Not ark. No, I don't know. Come on, come on, come on. what is it? Uh, Argus? No. But we need to get that. that. Okay, what is it? Come on, Bill. I can't have my daughter boy. Jeremy, what do they call them? <laughs> what? what ark <laughs> with a B in front of it. A bark. A bark, right? Yeah. Right? And what do dogs say? Bark. Okay! Bark. See, I taught... <laughs> so there we go. Go dogs! <laughs> Makes me think, what's this like, curtain of heaven she is pulling apart? Well, that's the veil. She's piercing the veil, remember? Right. Let's look at a couple more here. Here's from alchemy. Notice this figure, two-headed figure, representing the rebus, the completion of the alchemical work. Interestingly, standing within a... And, and notice here is, is the very traditional fairy tale way of depicting a moon. The man in the moon, right? The man in the moon. That's a tree of life. We won't spend a whole lot of time on this because it's, it's somewhat a field, but let's uh, see what else we've got here. Uh, oh, here is the tarot card of the moon. And what do we see? We see what? Two dogs. Two dogs, right? And we know that Sirius is how many stars? Two. Right. It's two dogs. It's not a single dog. It's actually two dogs out there, right? So here we have the two dogs. In the dark. One's dark. One's dark. We have two towers. Hmm. We have a lot of yuds. A lot of yuds. What are the yuds? Come on, what are these yuds? How many have we got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Oh, a lunar number, 18. What are the yuds? They come from the Hebrew alphabet, right? Now here's some Kabbalah for you. The yud is the seed of the Hebrew alphabet, but it also represents another kind of seed. We've seen this yud associated with with the tarot cards. Where did we see these yuds before? Raining down upon the earth. You see, that's what they're doing. These yuds, these cosmic seeds, are raining down upon the earth. Okay. Yeah. Well, also, since you had mentioned the um, diamond tessellations on the floor of the um, of Solomon's temple, that to me, sounds a little reminiscent of that, too. That. Another tarot card. <clears throat> Notice the prominent position of the lunar arc, with her foot placed upon the lunar arc. Eleven stars on the crown. No. Count again. Twelve. 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 Also, notice the heart-shaped. What is that? Remember the depictions of the grail, the dove descending, the host descending into the grail cup. And the moon. 
Yeah, and the moon, and notice the roses. Notice the water, the stream of water. What's growing around her feet there? They're not cattails, it's wheat. Wheat. Did you have your Wheaties this morning, Jeremy? Yeah. And then we have the staff that she holds in her hand. Right? There's the the globe with the two parallel lines representing the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and the cross which traditionally prior to its Christian associations what did the cross represent? Well the, the, the material world right? The, mater the world of matter it was the cross that, that lays out on the earth the east west north south cross but it's also the equinoctial cross of the great year, the equinoctial solstitial cross of the great year. We are going to get a whole lot more into this lunar connection because it turns out to be extremely important. Here are various ways of representing crosses. Now the one on top is particularly interesting. Notice how the cross has been united with an anchor. See that? The anchor. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to pull up another... It's not the secret, it's the covenant image. Right. Okay, let's look at this Masonic apron. Here's a Masonic apron loaded with cosmic secrets. Let's, let's look at some of the things we see on here. Right at the center of the apron, what, what, what do we find there? An ark. Yes, floating on the waters of the flood. Surrounding that, we find a wheel. There's our wheel symbol again. And surrounding that, we see a collection of various implements along with five-pointed stars. Above it, we see the square and compasses. We can see we could identify a number of these. This is a setting mall. You know, this is the, the, the book of sacred wisdom. This is the trowel. This is the level. This is the plumb bob. Here's a sword piercing a heart. And then up here, we find a, an urn or a cup. And over here, can you tell what that is? It's a beehive, yes, a beehive. Yeah, and then, of course, we have the all-seeing eye. Notice at the very center of the whole composition, which thing? Oh, down here. This is the coffin with the acacia plant growing. What is the coffin? Rep well, it represents, if in the Hiramic legend, Remember Hiram Abiff, just like the other, like Tammuz and Adonis and Jesus and Osiris and all the rest of these guys, he was slain. And then he was resurrected. Okay, let's look at this one. Here's another Masonic apron. Let's take a look at what we've got going on here. Now, as I've told you before, when we look at these things, this is a composition written in the language of symbology. You have to be able to read the language of symbology in order to read what this is saying. Because there's a whole coherent statement expressed right here. Just as if I open this book or I open, take one of these pages here and here's all the words, I could scramble these words, scramble these letters and it would lose all meaning. I take the same letters and I rearrange them into words and I arrange those words into certain patterns and it can convey meaning. This is a statement about archaic scientific knowledge, but it's encoded in, in symbolic language. And let's go through and see what we see again here. Um, beehive, right? There's the pyramids and two pillars. And what is this with the checkerboard floor, that temple? What would that represent? King Solomon. King Solomon's temple. And we have the five-pointed star with the letter G in it. 
the, the, the smooth and the rough ashlar. Very good, Bill. The smooth and the rough ashlar. So when the stone is first quarried from nature, it's in the rough shape. It then has to be smooth and trued, so it's now ready for being fit into the temple. Uh, is that maybe the symbology of that mountain versus the pyramids? You've got the rough mountain on the right, the smooth. Well, this is possibly this is this is Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah right here, and. You can't see it down here because the bottom is clipped off, but there's a coffin right there. Here's the setting mall and the trowel. What does the trowel do? When a, when a mason uses a trowel, it unites the separate stones into a single mass, right? Okay, then, look what's this. That's a moon. Yes. It's the Ouroboros serpent, the serpent swallowing its own tail. And within that, we find the square and the compasses and within the square and the compasses, we find the skull and the crossbones. And then, what do we find around the skull and the crossbones? There's those drops again that, that are, in some representations, they are the yuds, the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then we find a cluster of stars. And down here, that's not wheat, that's acacia. What's the symbolic of the escarambo? Ah, well, you might have to ask W on that one. What's the, uh, what's the flower above Solomon's temple? Oh, this? I'm guessing it's a rose because a rose has five petals, and a rose is a very important alchemical symbol. And, and then, of course, we have the sun, we have the moon, and up here we have an equilateral triangle with the letter Yud, the Hebrew letter. And you will see that if you ever see a Scottish Rite Mason, they will often be wearing a little gold band that has this symbol in it, the equilateral triangle with the letter Yud in it. And then the sun and the moon, and we got a couple more things here, tools that are used by Masons, and then we have very inconspicuous, but they're very important for, for teasing out the meaning of this. Notice this, and that, and that, and this, and this, and this. Those are part of a secret Masonic alphabet. Oh, the marking, the, the uh, Mason's marks. Yes. But they are representative. They're, it's a cipher. It's a Masonic cipher. Okay. Well, that's what I'm trying to reveal to you, piece by piece. Okay, let's take a look at this one. What's going on in this? Here's a Masonic medal, probably from the 1700s. And let's see what we see there. Skull and crossbones, a cross, and notice a serpent winding its way around in a certain fashion around that cross. Notice the sword with a wavy blade. And then you'll notice how many points on the star. Where have we seen that before? Where have we seen that eight-pointed star before? Let's see. Well, let's look at one more. Let's look at one more. This is, a, this is from a Masonic carpet. In a lot of Masonic lodges, as part of the teaching, you're carried through, you're conducted through a ritual, and one of the master masons will guide you by this big carpet that will be spread out, and it'll have symbols on it. And he will explain those symbols. And generally, uh, it takes, the, the inner meaning of those symbols is usually not disclosed it is usually, the proper way to do it is that the teacher guides the student to his or her own revelation of the meaning. But let's look here at some of the stuff we see going on. What's this? The temple, yes. What's this? Well, that's the counterpart of that checkerboard floor. 
uh, over here we see a couple of different kinds of vaults. Then what do we see here? Sun, all-seeing eye, moon, and what do we got right here? The seven stars, which represent what? The Pleiades. And then notice what we've got right here. The comet, yes. Then we've got three pillars, and we've got representing... The Greek Ionian and Corinthian. Right, we have the Corinthian, the Doric, and the Ionian, yep. all of which have their own inner symbolism. So, in order to penetrate into these mysteries, for example, you are told in the Lodge, okay, here it is, we're not going to tell you what it means, but if you want to know what it means, study astronomy. Study geometry, study architecture, study music, and then the meaning will disclose itself to you. Here we have WSB, standing for wisdom, strength, and beauty. And we have the three grand masters, Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and Hiram Abiff, the widow's son and the chief architect of the temple. What do we have there? There's the ark again. They don't want you to forget about that ark. Pythagorean theorem. An hourglass. What is an hourglass with wings on it? Depicting what? The passage of time. They want to call your attention to the passage of time. They don't want you to forget. There. And what about right here? There's that anchor again. Notice the anchor's association with the ark. That's not happenstance. Okay? Well, it looks like that the beehive and some of the other stuff is on a table right near that coffin. Well, there's, yeah, there's the beehive. And then we have the coffin with the acacia branch. What's this? That's the alembicum vitrum, the athenor in which the alchemical transmutation is taking place. And then, of course, we have the sickle, psi or the sickle. So, and here we have the Masonic Constitutions, the Book of Constitutions, with a sword, being protected by a sword. So the thing that you need to do, as anybody who gets into the occult uh, practice or the, the study of ancient wisdom or symbolism, is you have to make these symbols a part of your consciousness, an integral part of your consciousness. What does that mean? That means you think about them, you read about them, you study them, you learn them, you look for them in the environment around you because these things are concealed all around us in various ways. And then what happens is that slowly they begin to reveal themselves to you. And hopefully with what I have penetrated into these mysteries over 30 years of studying, I can accelerate your access to the inner knowledge. And I'm not going to stand up here and claim that I have fully fathomed the meaning of all of this because I haven't. However, the way the system works is it does provide um, objective confirmation. See, the way the, the hermetic tradition works is that the secret is multi-layered. But you don't have to penetrate to the ultimate, if for example in the Rosicrucians there's nine layers to the secret representing the, the nine vaults created by Frater CRC. The inner wisdom, the ultimate truth was in that inner vault. However, each time you successfully penetrated one of the layers, there was some confirmation that you were in fact on the right path. See, that's a very important part of how the hermetic tradition works. Because without that confirmation, too many people would, would give up before they got to the goal. The idea is that there's something that occurs along the way that confirms to the seeker, to the aspirant, that they are in fact following the right path. It's just like when you're going through that winding path through trail in the woods and you're going, geez, where are we? Are we on the right trail? And then all of a sudden you see that little blue marker up on the tree that tells you, yeah, yeah, you're on the right trail. It's the same way. But there's a lot of this stuff now that should be coming familiar to you. You know, you, so a lot of you instantly recognize that the seven stars stands for the Pleiades. We see the comet. God, have we talked about comets in here, right? 
Well, with all of that talk about comets, hopefully now when you look at this and you see a comet, you're going to go, okay, obviously whoever designed this, comets were important enough to include as part of this inner meaning of this composition. The hearts, I equate that with the, the idea of the, the blood, of course, and also the idea of the rose, also the idea of the, uh, the host that is being delivered into the grail by the dove that descends from heaven. But of all the things up there, the one that I'm the least convinced that I know what it really stands for is the heart. Love. Love. Sin, terror, What's that? <laughs> Unconditional love. Oh. Oh. No, well, I'll, I'll buy that. For, for now, that sounds like a good one to me. Because without unconditional love, what's the point of all this, right? You'd agree with that, right? Because the uh, mind and heart are two separate things that create. Yeah, now what happened? Okay. How much more time we got, Sam? Start to bring your clothes anytime there. Oh, okay. I have a thought for you. Okay. What if we didn't go to the moon, but instead we went to Mars? But nobody knows what Mars was like 1,296,000 years ago. Sure. We know they still got ice caps on Mars now, which means that they have water. And that might have been a place to go, and if they had the means to get to the moon way back then, they sure probably had the means to get to Mars as well. I would certainly be open to considering that as a hypothesis worthy of investigation. Certainly we know that Mars probably still conceals many mysteries about our own past. Well, how do we know that after we spent our time there that all of a sudden we said, hey, another meteor is going to hit Mars, so let's go back to Earth. Although from a practical standpoint, it might be easier to get to the moon than Mars. But we're going to definitely come back to that because I have a whole lot more information on the moon that I haven't even haven't even scratched the surface of yet. What about that point between the moon and the earth where the... L5? L5. No. The, 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 the whole numbers pointed to the... where there's no gravitation. That's the L5. L5. That's the Lagrangian? Yeah. Well, as far as I know, there's nothing that looks to me like it would be a human artifact there. Now, when you consider that had we, had we maintained the momentum of the Apollo program, instead of shutting it down, which was basically what, what happened in the, the final years of the Nixon administration, he terminated the Apollo program. But of course, if you go back, and it, I, I've got a program actually on this that I haven't shown you yet. Um, where I go back to the 60s and 70s and we look at the long-term plan that NASA had developed for the uh, ex human expansion into space. It involved the establishment of a permanent lunar colony by the mid-1980s. And, and that was, that was the, actually the, the longest-term scenario. That was the long-term scenario was that there was going to be, by the mid-1980s, a permanent l manned lunar presence. Now. Of course, what we've done is we've let our whole space capability, you know, we invest billions of dollars in creating this space capability, and then we let the whole thing just, you know, turn into trash. And again, I mean, that's, you know, that's government for you. But we went to the moon, we brought 800 and some pounds of lunar rocks back, and those lunar rocks came back and revealed a lot of interesting occult secrets. And that's part of one of the things we're going to talk about is what's, what was in those lunar rocks. And what, what, things that we also learned from the Apollo program that are not common knowledge, I mean, not that they're classified where, where ordinary people couldn't access it, it's just that ordinary people have not accessed it, scholars have not accessed it, but it's there. And it has to do with the nature of the moon and certain things that we will get into. Um, we see here Okay, let's just not spend any time, I guess, on all of this because we're, we're, Sam says we're running out of time here. 
Um, Pardon me. Let's statement on the what they were talking about earlier. Go to the moon. Go to the moon. Hmm. Uh, maybe. I'll, I'll go. The, I'll, I'll buy that. Let's go to the moon. Well, I certainly think that uh, you know we should be going back to the moon. Of that, I have no doubt whatsoever. Let's look at this occult symbol. Now you should be seeing some familiar things. <clears throat> Sun, moon, the all-seeing eye, the seven stars, the cross right within, with the, here, look, we see the big cross, but then we see this is a cross, but it's also an anchor. Yes, and then we see seven steps leading up to the skull and crossbones, and the cross, notice how the cross seems to be extending out of the skull, and this refers us directly to some of the deepest of the Christian mysteries, because if you recall, where was Christ crucified? What was the name of the mount? Golgotha, which meant the what? The skull, yes. Okay, up here... I can't read them, the letters on the steps. Let's play through That's steps. Just, Yeah. Well, there are letters. We'll get into that. Um, uh, notice, notice this. The Ark of the Moon and the Ark of the Anchor. Figured that all the old ancient anchors were all like that. Oh, yeah. I, I would think most of them probably were. I, I mean, I don't... Uh, well, a lot of the very ancient anchors were simply stones with big holes drilled through them. And they would put a massive rope through that hole and throw the stone down. They were, I think, called drogue stones. And usually a lot of them have been found scattered over Turkey um, on hillsides and so forth. Some of them quite large. Um, and a drogue stone could also be used to stabilize um, the keel of a ship parallel with the with a current flow by dragging it out behind. It would then orient the keel of the ship parallel to the current flow, so that it would prevent capsizing. Let's take. We'll close with this image: the broken column. What does that represent? Two related things on different scales. There's a line that, that Tolkien used in, in, in the book The Lord of the Rings to refer to the time, the time that was ancient to, to Middle Earth, and it was the former world age. And if you actually go in the book, and I think they carried that line right into the movie, and it's referred to several times throughout the movie. The breaking of the world. It refers not only to the breaking of the world, but it also refers to the destruction of, in other words, the column is an artifact of man. Man has created this thing, right, that was once this beautiful thing. It, it appears to have been a Corinthian column. And you see, this is the top of the Corinthian column, which would have been up here. But the, the column is broken. It's fallen over, and it lays there in ruin, okay? Also, we've got three steps. What's right here? The hourglass again. As the old saying that you find in English churchyards, all over these old English churchyards, watch and pray, time hastes away. And what do we have here? And what did we learn that that sometimes is a symbol for what? Death, but what? Thank you, Paul, the comet, yes. Also, the long hair. And we find... That the, that the very word comet comes from the word that means long hair. And what's she holding here? The grail, along with the acacia branch. Again, the symbol of resurrection. So we find the symbol here of destruction, but then she holds in her hand the acacia, which is a symbol of resurrection. And of course, according to some, uh, some occult traditions, when the dove 
came back that Noah let out to fly, it came back within a sprig of acacia in its mouth or in its beak. So concealed, what I'm getting at is concealed within all of this, there's a, there's a vast and epic story. And it's the story, it's our story on this planet and our own cosmic history. And if you think of it in those terms, I think we'll be, have a good foundation for beginning to penetrate into the, into the inner essence of these symbols and extract the meaning that has been concealed there for centuries and centuries until the time was ripe for humanity to access the true epic story of our, of our own history on this planet. And there we'll leave it for tonight.